Most smartphone users aren't aware of the fact that their device is constantly sending out information that can be used to track or identify them. Today, we'll use a Node MCU programmed with Arduino to send out hundreds of fake Wi-Fi beacons in order to decloak and even potentially take over the Wi-Fi data connection of nearby devices on this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. Any device that connects to Wi-Fi has a MAC address, and this unique address can be used to track you, which is why most manufacturers of smartphones have switched and made it so that these phones use a randomized MAC address. Now, MAC address randomization is a good idea. It prevents, in general, retailers from like Walmart, per, for example, from knowing when you come in and make the same purchase because it will change over time. However, this doesn't mean that you're perfectly safe because there are a number of attacks against this process, which we'll go into and explain. The first is the Karma attack, which basically creates a echo of different probe requests your phone is sending out. The second is some excellent research into setting up fake APs by Matthew Van Hoff. And the third is the ESP8266 beacon spammer by Spacehoon, which creates a whole bunch of fake networks, which we can use to basically brute force a list of networks that a particular device trusts. To explain this, I'll show on the whiteboard. Now the first attack we'll go over is an old classic called the Karma attack, which relies on phones basically supplying the information you need to create a man in the middle condition. Now the way this works is you have a client device, maybe a cell phone, which is asking if a certain network is nearby, let's say Starbucks. So based on the fact that it's calling for Starbucks, an attacker has all the information they need to pop up an open wireless network and say, hey, I'm Starbucks, why don't you connect to me? So this is a pretty real threat, and especially if you have an open network, which if this is something where you're using a password, it's a little different and this particular attack would not work. Now, most manufacturers actually phase this out because it presented a risk. However, it's still fairly easy to defeat MAC address randomization, even though this attack of uh, kind of utilizing a probe frame that gives you all the information you need doesn't really work anymore. Now instead, I read this paper by Matthew Van Hoff, who goes into the various ways you can defeat MAC address randomization, and in particular, I was interested in the part that goes over creating fake APs. Now in the paper, Matthew goes over a technique where he uses a SSI, uh, I think he used Airbase NG to create five different fake networks that were popular uh, SSIDs, which is service state uh, identifiers. Now, service set identifiers. Now, the way this looks is you have the attacker creating five different networks and hoping that nearby devices happen to respond to one, or maybe two. Now, this is pretty cool because it shows off that a relatively small amount of common SSIDs being advertised in networks can basically uncloak a whole bunch of different devices nearby who normally would have randomized MAC addresses and, and not be as easy to kind of follow. But I thought that this attack could be improved upon in order to increase the number of SSIDs that you're advertising, kind of brute forcing this list instead of just looking for one. Now, in order to accomplish that, we need to create a swarm of beacons that basically pretends to have a whole bunch of common uh, open networks from a given area. Now, this list within a phone of trusted uh, open networks is basically a goldmine for hackers because it allows you to not only take it, uh, control of the person's Wi-Fi connection whenever you want, but also unmask them whenever you want so that you can be able to see if they're in the area or connected to a particular network. Now, to accomplish this, I took a look at Spacehoon's excellent beacon spammer program, which takes the Node MCU and allows you to run with Arduino a sketch that will basically send out a whole bunch of beacons that pretend to be networks in order to kind of trick people into thinking a bunch of joke networks are in the area. Now, this didn't originally work for this purpose because when the beacon spammer sent out a bunch of 
beacons, they were all formatted to 32 characters long, which basically wouldn't match up inside any nearby devices because the list inside of it would take a look at that uh, string of characters and know that 32 characters wasn't equal to you know, the, the length of the uh, network name that it was used to. So even if the first part matched, it still wouldn't work. So I reached out to Spacehoon and he modified the program. So instead, it changes it so in, it's just the actual length of the SSID. So nearby devices are like, oh, wow, there's all these open networks I'm used to. So they'll respond with multiple attempts to connect, which is pretty exciting because for a particular device, you can get a list of four, sometimes even five different uh, SSIDs that they respond to. This is basically brute forcing the list of trusted networks that are inside the phone, allowing you to kind of uh, pick and choose which one you want to use to take over the device if that's your goal. Now to pull off this sort of attack, we'll need a node MCU so that we can program it in Arduino, which requires Arduino IDE as well. We'll also need to monitor our progress to make sure it's working, so I recommend Wireshark in order to follow this guide. Once you have all those things together, you can begin. So before we get started, I also want to point out that this research is based on a paper by Matthew Van Hoff, and you can go to his website here if you want to check out his paper. Now, the paper is called Why MAC Address Randomization is Not Enough, an Analysis of Wi-Fi Network Discovery Mechanisms. So in this paper, uh, Matthew goes over the way that he's able to use a fake access point in order to decloak different networks. And we're going to go ahead and use Spacehoon's excellent project, uh, which you can find at his website spacehoon.d and then under projects. So he's worked on a lot of really awesome stuff, and you should definitely check this out if you're interested. And he also has a Patreon if you think this project's cool and want to support some more cool stuff. But we're going to go and go, uh, go ahead and go to the ESP8266 Beacon Spammer. So at the GitHub page here, you can see that the installation is pretty straightforward, and this project is designed to create a whole bunch of fake networks that look something like this. Now, if you were to tap on one of these, the actual attempt to join it has a really long space at the end and a quotation mark, and this is because the original program was designed to make everything 32 characters. So this was more of kind of a, pr a prank device, which is really cool and shows people how they can quickly configure something uh, in Arduino to have an effect over Wi-Fi. But we can take this a step further, and fortunately Spacehoon modified it so we can go ahead download it and uh, be able to, with a little bit of modification, create a local uh, beacon swarmer that can unmask nearby devices and determine what their trusted networks are. So to get started, we'll need to have the ESP8266 development board, we'll need to install the Arduino IDE, and then we'll need to install the ESP8266 Arduino core um, in order to be able to interface with this board. Now we covered all of that in our last video, so I'm going to go ahead and open Arduino IDE and show you what everything should look like. Now while this opens, it's worth pointing out that you should plug in your uh, Node MCU at this point, uh, and if you're having some issues communicating with it, we found that different cables uh, have different qualities in terms of being able to either power it or uh, allow you to communicate, so keep that in mind if you're having issues. Now here's our actual script we'll be using. And let me expand this and show you what the settings under tools should look like. Now the board selected should be the, the node MCU. And if you don't see this, it's because you haven't first installed the required libraries. So go to file and preferences. And under this setting, you should see additional board manager URLs. And this is where you should put this JSON uh, address right here. So once that is provided, you should be able to go to the board manager here and go into the search to install the ESP8266 once it finishes downloading community version here. Now once this is installed, you'll be able to interface with the board and do all kinds of cool stuff. So go ahead and uh, install it. In my case, I'm just going to update it. And this will uh, include all the libraries you need to be able to write to your board. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel this because we're doing a demo. Uh, but since this is already installed, I can close. 
So once you have Arduino IDE installed and you have the Node MCU library or the ESP8266 library ready to go with the Node MCU selected, you can see that it auto selected the port uh, for the Node MCU when I plugged it in. So make sure that yours looks something like this and that the uh, other settings more or less match and you should be good to begin pushing a program to the Node MCU. Now we'll go back to the GitHub page and we can see that the next step is to download this project. You can also go ahead and look at the most updated version by going to the top, clicking on the ESP8266 and then clicking on this sketch here. If you want to just take this and copy it and paste it in, you'll need to click on raw so that we don't get these line numbers and then control A to get all the text. From there, we can go into the sketch and paste it. And there you go. We should have a complete sketch ready for us to push to the node. And if we expand it, we can see all the examples that Spacehoon put in here for us. Drop it's like a hotspot. It hurts when I pee. Oh, these are great. Um, so we want these to actually reflect the local area. So what we're going to do is take advantage of one of our previous videos, which covered Wiggle Wi-Fi. Now, if we go to wiggle.net, we can actually go ahead and download individual captures that we've taken on, which allows us to use our phone to gather a bunch of open networks in the area and then download a list that is a CSV export that just has a whole bunch of SSIDs that are basically open networks nearby. So what I've done, just as an example, and you can gather as many or as little as you want, but I've taken a list of these and overcome a couple problems, which is the fact that you'll probably see a whole bunch of networks with the same name. Now, if you want to sort these, you can go ahead and use this example. I've created uh, nets.txt. And I've put a couple examples here of the kinds of networks that you might see from, let's say, a, dump, a um, war driving dump, where you have network four, one, two, three, four, and these names might overlap a little bit. So we don't want them to overlap. So we can press Control X here to save. And if you want to sort this list, we can use the command sort and then the name of the text file to sort, pipe unique tac c, pipe sort tac r, and what this will do is it will sort it by uh, so that everything is unique and show you how many times each one occurs. That way, if you pass a whole bunch of open networks with the same name, it'll put it higher up on the list and you'll be able to make sure to include that because you know it'll have a much higher chance of causing uh, nearby devices to react to it. So if you're incorporating war driving uh, to make this technique more effective, I highly encourage you to use the sort method in order to make sure that the uh, networks that you're adding are um, good ones for getting a whole bunch of traffic. So I also created a Python program in order to help organize these, and I'll show you briefly how it works. If you want to take a look at the file, you can type nano and then the organize.py file. And when it's open, you can see that all it does is it appends a new line character and an apostrophe at the end and an apostrophe at the beginning. Now, this is helpful because uh, the script in Arduino needs this in order to correctly add it to Spacehoon's examples here. Oops, that's the updated example. This is the older example. So in order to replace these, we need to make sure that they match. That means having an apostrophe here and a new line apostrophe here. So I've gone ahead and done this already. So let's take a look at what this looks like. And in our updated sketch here, which I call the SoCal decloaker, because these are uh, SSIDs from Southern California, we can see a whole bunch of networks that I've personally war driven by and captured. So we have LAX, um, the airport here. We have JW Marriott, a hotel. We have LAC, that's a community college, and a whole bunch of other networks that I've observed, including coffee shops and other popular places that Southern Californians like to go in order to decloak nearby phones. Now we have a whole bunch of these, and all we need to do once we have the correct board selected and these changes done is go ahead and push this by hitting upload. And I'll need to make sure that this is plugged in properly. Now here, it's important to go through and make sure that we have the correct board selected. And when we scroll down, 
we can see we have the Node MCU 1.0 available. Once we select that, we should be able to hit upload and we should be able to, on our Node MCU, see the LED flashing. This will take a little bit to compile and then send over. And once it does, it should immediately start creating a bunch of wireless networks uh, that will potentially trick our computer into thinking that all these networks that we see on the screen here are nearby. Now, once the percentage at the bottom hits 100%, your node MCU should restart and begin immediately spamming out these packets. Now, it's worth pointing out that I have seen the condition where you can see these packets on Wireshark, but nearby devices can't spot them. And this is usually because, for whatever reason, plugging it into a laptop maybe just doesn't give it, enough, uh, give it quite enough power. So I'm going to unplug this from the computer and plug it into a outlet power source, and we should see a stronger signal overall. Now this is because some cables and some different uh, computers uh, USB ports don't provide enough power for the Node MCU to be able to do what we need it to do. So now when I actually click on this, we should be able, when we click on select network, to see a whole bunch of fake ones. And we are nowhere near a Burger King, so a lot of these networks are obviously fake. So it looks like it's working. Now, in order to test and see what exactly it looks like when devices react to this uh, Beacon Spammer, let's take a look at some packets that we captured earlier today in a location where we don't care about, so we don't need to blur anything. I'm going to open this up in Wireshark, and I'll show you how we can begin sifting through the information to learn more about the devices nearby that are kind of reacting to this um, Beacon Spammer we've created. In order to make this all work, you'll need to make sure that everything appears under channel 1 in this column here. Now that's important because if different devices are responding on a different channel, you won't see them because you're just staying on this one channel, and you can control this behavior as well by taking a look at the way that I've modified the Beacon Spammer code. If you look in Arduino IDE, you can see that the variable that is responsible for both appending spaces and preventing the packet from being seen as a WPA network are both selected as false, whereas the channels that we're operating have been reduced to only indicate we want to operate on channel 1. This is because if I included other channels, it would produce packets on those channels, but we wouldn't be able to see the activity because we're stuck on one channel when we're listening on Wireshark. Now in the real world, you can go ahead and use whatever channels you want, but it will be more difficult to monitor the responses if they're happening on channels you can't listen in on. Now back in Wireshark, we can begin to filter through this data with a couple of handy filters. Now the only real difference between seeing this live and seeing a pre-recorded uh, version of the data is that at the very bottom of this it will constantly be increasing, but you'll see that we very quickly get a whole bunch of packets that are kind of difficult to manage. Now I chose channel 1 because there's typically not a ton of traffic on it in our area, but you might want to choose one that is relatively uh, deserted in your particular area to make sure you don't get too much interference. Now I'm going to go under filters, and the first thing I'm going to use is this no beacon frames filter. Now what this will do is you can see these are mostly beacon frames announcing all these fake Wi-Fi networks, so we want to be able to cut through these and start seeing other activity that's happening on the same channel. When we put in this filter, it'll go ahead and start displaying them and give us a percentage of the packets that are being displayed on the screen. This percentage tells us how many of the packets overall are being displayed based on the filter that we've input. Now we can see different types of packets have been sent. We have data packets, a request to send, clear to send, acknowledgement, and other types of less interesting ones. But we want to learn more information about the devices that are reacting to our node MCU. Now in particular, we want to learn about authentication requests and also pro requests that have been directed at one of the fake networks that we've created. So I'm going to go ahead and use one of these authentication filters to go through the results and show only the authentication frames. I'll input the following capture filter and then press this button here to apply it and you'll see it'll scan through again, in this case only showing us 0.1% of the 33,000 or 30, 33, wait, of the 339,362 packets we've captured. This equals 294 packets. And as you can see, these are all authentication requests going towards the fake networks we've created. Now you can see in the destination here that 
there are slight variations in the last octets of the MAC address of the fake networks that are attracting these authentication requests. This is interesting because it tells us which networks are more effective at attracting attention from nearby devices. Now we can also go into tools, I'm oh, sorry, wireless, and then WLAN traffic. And here we can see some very interesting statistics about the wireless traffic we've managed to record. Now, typically this takes a little bit to parse, but as soon as it does, you can go ahead and click on two different columns in order to learn about the networks that were the most effective at attracting attention from nearby devices. We'll go ahead and click on Auths to order this list by authentication packets that we've detected being directed at a particular BSSID. Now, this can take a little bit of time to compile, but once it does, you can click on the Auths column here and we'll organize everything by the amount of authentication packets that were directed at it. Now, you can see here that Google Starbucks, Guest T-Mobile, McDonald's Free Wi-Fi, and DHS Guest were all very popular, which led to a whole bunch of responses from nearby devices. You can also click on Probe Requests and see which networks had a lot of requests directed at them. In particular, the airport looks like there was a lot, Spectrum Wi-Fi, and T-Mobile Wingman. These networks we've discovered will cause nearby devices to automatically connect to them. And you can tell by the amount of activity in packets which ones are more popular. You can even go and see the individual breakdown to learn which individual device responded to which individual network to create kind of a fingerprint by going through and looking at the data. Now I can go ahead and close out of this view. And back in Wireshark, I can use an interesting technique to detect only to the transmissions to our fake networks. So in order to use this, we'll need to go back here and type two brackets, a colon, and then zero and three. Now what this is telling the program is to basically only, oops, now what this tell, is telling the program is basically to only pay attention to the first three octets of the MAC address. So it'll match these and basically not discriminate between the small difference in the end of the last octet of the MAC address on our fake networks. Now as this goes through, we should be able to see all the traffic that's being directed at our fake networks because this WLAN.DA means destination address, meaning traffic that is directed towards this MAC that matches the general pattern of our fakes. The result of this filter is 262 authentication attempts to our fake beacon. And as you scroll down, you can see that these are actually a lot of Apple devices. So it seems from our testing that Apple devices in particular really like these fake hotspots and will go after them pretty indiscriminately. But then again, we might have just been in a place where there were a lot of people with Apple devices. Now a hacker could take a look at the source MAC address here and see that this is an Apple device that is willing to connect to a fake network, which we see the destination MAC for on the right side here. This means that the attacker could just create a fake network with the same name, and the Apple device that's associated with this MAC address on the left side would just connect to it without warning the user. Now obviously that could lead to a man in the middle attack like phishing pages or even just being able to be tracked, but either way, the ability to take over someone's data connection without them knowing is a pretty big advantage as a hacker. If you want to prevent this kind of tracking, there's a number of steps you can take that might improve your chances. The first and most obvious is to turn off your Wi-Fi when you're not using it. However, this might not actually go far enough. Most modern phones use a GPS or assisted GPS in order to find your relative location when a GPS signal is not available. That means you need to go in and turn off the assisted GPS or high accuracy GPS setting in order to actually turn this off and make sure your device isn't actually sending out things on Wi-Fi when you've thought that you've turned it off. Another option is actually just turning on airplane mode, but that goes pretty far and most users don't want to take that additional step. Now the most, most basic thing you can do is always remember to delete networks when you are done with them, especially open networks, because they're an opportunity for an attacker to basically take control of your data connection. That means as soon as you connect to a hotel or coffee shop Wi-Fi and then you're leaving, if it's an open network especially, make sure to go in and delete that from your list of trusted networks, because do you really trust it popping up in the middle of nowhere? especially if it's a common SSID, you can see that this is a pretty easy attack to execute. So make sure you get rid of those if you're not really using them.
That's all we have for this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any thoughts on the show, we'd love to hear from you on my Twitter. We'll see you next time.